Hello everyone and welcome to episode 5 of Storytime with Mr Hack. So we have been reading this. It's a book called I, Robot and it's by Isaac Asimov. It's a collection of nine short stories by Asimov that imagines the development of positronic, that's human-like, with a form of artificial intelligence. So the development of positronic robots and wrestles with the moral implications of the technology. The stories were all written between 1940 and 1950 before they were put together in this book form in 1950. The nine stories are linked by a framing narrative involving a reporter's interview with Susan Calvin, who's a former robo-psychologist at US Robots and Mechanical Men, Inc. The stories center on problems that arise from the ethical programming summed up in Asimov's famed Three Laws of Robotics. We did go over these three uh, at the beginning of the first story, but they are really central to the narrative. Uh, so here they are again. Number one. A robot may not injure, uh, injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Number two, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And number three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first and second laws. So those are the three laws of robotics. <laughs> Run around. It was one of Gregory Powell's favourite platitudes that nothing was to be gained from excitement. So when Mike Donovan came leaping down the stairs toward him, red hair matted with perspiration, Powell frowned. What's wrong? He said. Rate of fingernail? Yay! snarled Donovan feverishly. What have you been doing the sub-levels all day? He took a deep breath and blurted out. Speedy never returned. Powell's eyes widened momentarily and he stopped on the stairs. Then he recovered and resumed his upward steps. He didn't speak until he reached the head of the flight and then you sent him after the selenium. Yes. And how long has he been out? Five hours now. Silence. This was a devil of a situation. Here they were on Mercury, exactly 12 hours, and already up to the eyebrows in the worst sort of trouble. Mercury had long been the jinx world of the system, but this was drawing it rather strong, even for a jinx. Powell said, start at the beginning and let's get this straight. They were in the radio room now with its already subtly antiquated equipment untouched for the 10 years previous to their arrival. Even 10 years, technologically speaking, meant so much. Compare Speedy with the type of robot they must have had back in 2005. But then advancing robotics these days were tremendous. Sorry, but then advances in robotics these days were tremendous. Powell touched the still gleaming metal surface gingerly. The air of disuse that touched everything about the room and the entire station was infinitely depressing. Donovan must have felt it. He began, I tried to locate him by the radio, but it was no go. Radio isn't any good on the Mercury sun side, not past 20 miles anyway. That's one of the reasons the first expedition failed and we can't put up the ultra-wave equipment for weeks yet. Skip all that. What did you get 
I located the unorganized body signal in the short wave. It was no good for anything except his position. I kept track of him that way for two hours and plotted the results on the map. There was a yellow square of parchment in his hip pocket, a relic of the unsuccessful first expedition, and he slapped it down on the desk with vicious force, spreading it flat with the palm of his hand. Powell, hands clapped across his chest, watched it at long range. Donovan's pencil pointed nervously. The Red Cross is the Selenium Pool. You marked it yourself. Which one is it? interrupted Powell. There were three that McDougall located for us before he left. I sent Speedy to the nearest, naturally, 17 miles away. But what difference does that make? There was, there was tension in his voice. There are the pencil dots that mark Speedy's position. And for the first time, Powell's artificial aplomb was shaken and his hands shot forward for the map. Are you serious? This is impossible. There it is, growled Donovan. The little dots that marked the position formed a rough circle about the red cross of the selenium pool. And Powell's fingers went to his brown moustache, the unfailing signal of anxiety, Donovan added. In the two hours I checked on him, he circled that damn pool four times. It seems likely to me that he'll keep that forever. Keep that up forever. Do you realise the position we're in? Powell looked up shortly and said nothing. Oh yes, he realised the position they were in. It worked itself out as simply as a syllogism. The photocell banks that alone stood between the full power of Mercury's monstrous sun and themselves were shot to hell. The only thing that could save them was selenium. The only thing that could get the selenium was speedy. If speedy didn't come back, no selenium. No selenium, no photocell banks. No photo banks. Well, death by slow broiling is one of the more unpleasant ways of being done in. Donovan rubbed his red mop of hair savagely and expressed himself with bitterness. We're, we're the laughing stock of the system, Greg. How can any, how can everything have gone so wrong so soon? The great team of Powell and Donovan is sent out to Mercury to report on the advisability of reopening the Sunside Mining Station with modern techniques and robots, and we ruin everything the first day. A purely routine job too. We'll never live it down. We won't have to, perhaps, replied Powell quietly. If we can't do something quickly, living anything down, or even just plain living, will be out of the question. Don't be stupid. If you feel funny about it, Greg. I don't. It was criminals sending us out here with only one robot. And it was your bright idea that we could handle the photo cell banks ourselves. Now you're being unfair. It was a mutual decision and you know it. All we needed was a kilogram of selenium. A steel head dielectrode plate and almost and about three hours time and there are pools of pure selenium all over sunside mcdool's spectro reflector spotted three for us in five minutes didn't it what the devil we couldn't have waited for next conjunction well what are we going to do pal you've got an idea i know you have or you wouldn't be so calm you're no more a hero than I am. Go on, spill it. We can't go after Speedy ourselves, Mike. Not on the sun side. Even the new inso suits aren't good enough for more than 20 minutes in direct sunlight. But you know the old saying, set a robot to catch a robot. Look, Mike, maybe things aren't so bad. We've got six robots down in the sub-levels and that sub-levels that we may be able to use if they work. If they work. 
There was a glint of sudden hope in Donovan's eyes. You mean six robots from the first expedition? Are you sure? They may be sub-robotic machines. Ten years is a long time as far as ro robot, robot types are concerned, you know. No, they're robots. I've spent all day with them and I know. They've got positronic brains. Primitive, of course. He placed the map in his pocket. Let's go down. The robots were on the lower sub-level, all six of them surrounded by musty packing cases of uncertain content. They were large, extremely so, and even though they were in a sitting position on the floor, legs straddled out before them, their heads were a good seven feet in the air. Donovan whistled. Look at the size of them, will you? The chest must be... Ten feet around? That's because they're supplied with the old McGuffey gears. I've been over the insides. Crummiest set you've ever seen. Have you powered them yet? No, there wasn't any reason to. I don't think there's anything wrong with them. Even the diaphragm is in reasonable order. They might talk. He had unscrewed the chest plate of the nearest as he spoke inserted the two-inch sphere that contained the tiny spark of atomic energy that was a robot's life. There was difficulty in fitting it, but he managed and then screwed the plate back on again in laborious fashion. The radio controls of more modern models had not been heard of ten years earlier, and then to the other five. Donovan said uneasily, They haven't moved. No orders to do so replied Powell succinctly. He went back to the first in the line and struck him on the chest. You, do you hear me? The monster's head bent slowly and the eyes fixed themselves on Powell. Then in a harsh, squawking voice like that of a medieval phonograph, he greeted, Yes? Master. Powell grinned humorously at Donovan. Did you get that? Those were the days of the first talking robots when it looked as if the use of robots on Earth would be banned. The makers were fighting that and they built good, healthy slave complexes, complexes into the damn machines. It didn't help them, muttered Donovan. No, it didn't, but they sure tried. He turned once more to the robot. Get up. The robot towered upwards slowly and Donovan's head craned and his puckered lips whistled. Powell said, can you get up, get out upon the surface in the light? There was consideration while the robot's slow brain worked then. Yes, master. Good. Do you know what a mile is? Another consideration and another slow answer. Yes, master. We will take you up to the surface and indicate a direction. You will go about 17 miles and somewhere in the general region you will meet another robot smaller than yourself. You understand so far? Yes, master. You will find this robot and order him to return. If he does not wish to, you are to bring him back by force. Donovan clutched at Powell's sleeve. Why not send him for the Selenium Direct? Because I want speedy back, nitwit. I want to find out what's wrong with him. And to the robot, all right, you, follow me. The robot remained motionless and his voice rumbled. I don't master, but I cannot. You must mount first. His clumsy arms had come together with a thwack, blunt fingers interlacing. Powell stared and then pinched at his moustache. Uh-oh. Donovan's eyes bulged. We've got to ride him like a horse. I guess that's the idea. I don't know why, though. I can't see. Ah, yes, I do. 
I told you they were playing up robot safety in, these de in those days. Evidently, they were going to sell the notion of safety by not allowing them to move without a mahout on their shoulders all the time. What do we do now? That's what I've been thinking, muttered Donovan. We can't get on the surface with a robot or without. We can't get out on the surface with a robot or without. Oh, for the love of Pete. And he snapped his fingers twice. He grew excited. Give me the map you've got. I haven't studied it for two hours for nothing. This is a mining station. What's wrong with using the tunnels? The mining station was a black circle on the map and the light dotted lines that were tunnels stretched out about it in spiderweb fashion. Donovan studied the list of symbols at the bottom of the map. Look, he said, the small black dots are opening to the surface and here's one maybe three miles away from the selenium pool. There's a number here. You'd think they'd write larger. 13A. If the robots know their way around here. Powell shot the question and received a dull. Yes, master, in reply. Get your inso suit, he said with satisfaction. It was the first time either had worn the inso suits, which marked one time more than which marked one time more than either had expected to upon their arrival the day before, and they tested their limb movements uncomfortably. The inso suit was far bulkier and far uglier than the regulation spacesuits, but withal considerably lighter due to the fact that they were entirely non metallic they they were entirely non metallic in composition composed of heat resistant plastic and chemically treated cork layers and equipped with a desiccating unit to keep the air, bo air bone dry the inso suits could withstand the full glare of mercury's sun for 20 minutes five to ten minutes more as well without actually killing the occupant and still the robot's hands formed the stirrup nor did it betray the slightest atom of surprise at the grotesque figure into which powell had been converted powell's radio harshened voice boomed out are you ready to take us to exit 13a yes master good thought powell they might lack radio control but at least they were fitted for radio reception mount one or the other mic he said to donovan he placed a foot in the improvised stirrup and swung upward he found the seat comfortable there was the hump back of a robot evidently shaped for the purpose a shallow groove along each shoulder for the thighs and two elongated ears whose purpose now seemed obvious. Powell seized the ears and twisted the head. His mount turned ponderously. Lead on Macduff. But he did not feel at all light-hearted. Okay, so we'll leave it there and we will pick this up again tomorrow. So Powell and Donovan have set out on a potentially hazardous mission in Mercury with a robot that is very, very old. Okay, right. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.